సహనాభవతు సహనౌ బణుక్తు సహావీర్యం కర్వాహై తేజస్వినావదీతం మస్తు మా విద్విషావాయి ఓం శాంతి 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 మే దట్ వన్ ప్రొటెక్ట్ అస్ బౌత్ మే దట్ వన్ నరిష్ అస్ బౌత్ మే వీ వర్క్ టుగెదర్ విత్ గ్రేట్ ఎనర్జీ మే ఆర్ స్టడీ బి అల్యూమండ్ May we not unnecessarily cavalry with each other. Peace, peace, peace be unto all. Om Ramaya Rama Bhadraya Rama Chandraya Vedase Raghunathaya Nathaya Sitaya Patai Namaha Salutations to the Lord Rama, present in all beings as Rama, Rama Bhadra and Rama Chandra the lord of the ragu clan the husband of sita om shri ram jay ram jay jay ram victory and glory to rama so last week we left off the story but just to recap a little bit we understand that of course uh, rama went after the golden deer or the deer with uh, which looked so appealing and a drama was enacted whereby rama uh, was made to chase the deer which was marich in disguise and uh, this gave the opportunity for ravana driven by lust and revenge and jealousy to come and look for the exquisite sita whose reputation for beauty had been described and so as soon as Lakshmana left the protection of Sita after a very difficult conversation with Sita and uh, he goes to assist because of course Maricha had just called out for help using Rama's voice and uh, no sooner had Lakshmana left the ashram then of course as we know an ascetic made his appearance chanting the vedas he was draped in this color in saffron robes he had a staff he had a wooden bow as all ascetics do and he was in possession of all of these things dressed up as a holy mendicant wandering monk naturally sita pure in heart and dedicated to duty receives him with reverence because of his rank in society and offers him fruits and roots as is the custom and so he she is deceived which is an interesting philosophical tale because we are all deceived by appearances things are not quite what they seem and sometimes things which look legitimate are dressed up as evil and so even sita who philosophically represents the estranged soul under the spell of maya even she the mother of the universe philosophically speaking and theologically speaking is deceived by maya and so the visitor defines the physical beauty of sita but transgresses by doing this the boundaries of holy man and he asks why she was all alone in that demon infested dangerous region this is how the conversation begins and the guileless sita felt nothing should be hidden from somebody who is a holy man and she recounts all of the particulars about herself and about her husband and about his brother her brother-in-law lakshmana and then she also adds that if the holy man waited a while her husband would return and her husband being a noble person would also pay great homage to him and the seeming holy man which is often addressed up loath to be long in that uh, 
holy garb. He didn't want to live in it for very long. He didn't like the association of it. He now comes out in his true colors. And he introduces himself as the king of Lanka. And he describes Lanka as a land of plenty and land of luxury. And he advises Sita to abandon the fugitive, that is Rama, and also abandon the hardship of forest life. He can offer much, much more. And to accept the hand of the all-powerful monarch of Lanka together with all the enjoyments and luxuries of life. And we are all faced with these options. And Ravana's calculation really was based on his mind, which is steeped in worldliness. And he calculated also that she was the same and that she was just like any other ordinary person or ordinary woman. And Sita could be tempted by pleasure, by power, by pomp, by untold wealth, by status, by all these things. And so the best way, he figures, to disgrace Rama was to induce Sita to go and elope with him voluntarily. And so the erstwhile meek Sita now flares up like a lioness. She has this within her. I am ever Rama's. By directing your thought on me, you have paved the way for self-destruction. And wretch, you are a wretch that you are. Run away from here before Rama comes and takes away your life. And that is like a red rag to a bull. And so the erstwhile uh, meek, uh, meek Sita turns around and displays herself as this wonderful image. We can even imagine the mother Durga coming out in this way. But Ramana miscalculated, you see, and he thinks that uh, where temptation has failed, then what is your other option? Threatening. So maybe he thinks that threats might succeed. So he speaks sternly and significant. The celestials tremble before Ravana, the ten-headed headed, uh, one. Don't forget, this is the one who got all the boons from all the deities that uh, emanate from the cosmic mind by his meditation. And meditation is no guarantee of purity. Meditation is simply concentration on whatever you want. The wind dares not blow on me, he boasts, and the sun subdues his scorching rays in my presence. Rivers suspend their flow, and the forest foliage waves not when I come, says he. And Rama is just a puny creature, just a person, because all his boons are for those who are over and above puny humans, mere humans. And he rejects him as a scoff and reject him, he encourages Sita. He scoffs at Rama as just a mere mortal, nothing more. And he says, join me. And then he puts a threat, lest you suffer untold misery, and there's the threat. And of course, the frail woman wouldn't be frightened by all these extraordinary powers. We are often prone to think that people are extremely powerful, and we get frightened by this. We get power, uh, frightened by various threats in life, and threatened by people, and various unexpected events and scenes that happen within our life. But the true person of spirituality has no fear, knowing that there is only one without a second. And she does not uh, su uh, submit to fear, nor to any extraordinary powers. And so she stands adamant, and then Ravana assumes a gigantic form, and he lifts Sita forcibly and places her in his flying chariot and takes her off. And she raises the alarm and she cries out, calling to Rama, calling to Lakshmana in quick succession for help and protection. But they were too far away to hear her, that's the problem. And the wily Ravana knows this. And so the timely help from them was 
really out of the question. They couldn't come and rescue her. So she appeals to everything else, knowing that divinity is in everything. There's a spirit in the tree and a spirit in every aspect of life here on earth. Knowing this, she appeals to the very trees and to all the beings in the forest to bear witness to the fate that has befallen her. And then she begs them to tell Rama how she has been stolen away by Ravana. And then there's the intervention by Jatayu, the, uh, the very ancient bird, the ancient friend of Dasarata. He was a, a great eagle, and as we know, the eagle is the Vahana, or the vehicle of Vishnu. And so it's not an accident that he gets introduced into the story. And he is uh, the brother of Samputi, and he is the friend of Dasarata, Rama's father. And he comes into the scene exhibiting an element of valor and bravery and strength. So as all of this happens, Jatayu, who was half asleep on a tree, he sees the flying chariot passing by, and he is startled by a woman's cry. And it's a cry of distress. And so at that moment, he wakens up. He's wide awake, and he recognizes Sita. He recognizes her by her voice. And she also sees him, and she appeals to him for rescue. And Jatayu's blood was fired by the sight of her piteous plight. And so what does he do? He throws himself in the way of this flying chariot, this aerial car, something like a low-flying aircraft, something like possibly a helicopter. Hold, hold, what is all this? Wait, wait, can't stop. But the king of Lanka, of course, is intent on carrying Sita away by force. And Sita cries out and says, yes, he's carrying me away by force against my will. He's uh, abducting me. But what can you do to prevent it, my poor old friend? Because she knows his age and his capabilities. So fly to Rama and Lakshmana. Don't try and stop this. You'll come off worse for wear, but fly to Rama and Lakshmana and tell them about my helpless condition, my helpless plight. But you see, Jatayus is a, an eagle, and you know that the eagle is the symbol in the ancient Roman army and still remains as a symbol of the Romanovs in Russia. And he has no mood to be a messenger because fighting is in his blood and the blood of generations of his lordly ancestors. And they have all ruled the air and they don't know any fear. And his blood was on fire. And he didn't care for Ravana and his might, and he only saw the princess in distress. And so he thinks of his great friend, his old friend, Dasarata, and his promise to Rama. And he was resolved that this outrage shouldn't occur while he lived to prevent it. And so Jataya now Instead of attacking, he talks. O king, I am Jatayu, king of the eagles. A king like you, listen to me, brother king, forbear from this wicked act. How can you call yourself a king and do this shameful wrong? This is a repetition of what we discussed last week. Isn't the rule of kings to protect the honor of women? There was a, a great age of chivalry where kings were to protect the weak, protect the unprotected. Forbear from this wicked act. And uh, Sita is just not an ordinary woman, she's a princess. So I'm warning you, you shall surely per uh, perish unless you leave her go and go. And her very look, by the way, it's going to reduce you to ashes because the nature of purity is like that. A mere look can reduce a person to ashes. A look means a thought. Holy people and holy men and disciplined yogis, a mere thought 
will reduce somebody to ashes, not literally, of course, but metaphorically speaking. I could even say literally, if, if you like, in some cases. He says, you're carrying a venomous cobra in your heart, in your bosom, and the noose of Yama, of death himself, is round your neck. Don't you see it? And is dragging you to perdition. But you see somebody who is steeped in this passion, if you will, this great, great obsession, is blind to all of the consequences that may happen. All reasoning is gone. And Jatayu again says, he admits, I'm old, I'm unarmed. You're young, you're fully armed and seated in a chariot. And yet, uh, I can't look on while you carry off Sita. Why do you do this cowardly act behind Rama's back? If you have any grievance against him, meet him face to face. Oh, you would fly away from me, would you? You shall not escape while I'm alive. I care not for your chariot or your ten heads or any of your amounts of powers or your boons from the deities or from Brahma because your, your beads shall roll on the ground that you have polluted with your presence. And get down from your car right now and fight if you're not a coward as well as a thief. What great bravery. And in the midst, in the midst of overwhelming odds, actually, he's challenging in his old age, Ravana. And Ravana's reaction, of course, just to recap what we discussed, he flares up naturally in a rage because that's his nature, his anger. And anger comes from thwarted desires. And he attacks Chitayo just like that, without any consideration of his words or his age or his lack of armaments. And it was like a clash, even so, between a mighty wind and a massive rain cloud. And the battle raged in the sky above the forest and Jataya fought like a winged mountain. And Ravana aimed deadly darts at him, but the eagle intercepted them and he did it all with his talons and tore Ravana's flesh. And the enraged Rakshasa became even more enraged. He dispatched sharp, sharp serpent-like pinpoint missiles against the bird. And we see that nothing much has changed. Our modern warfare is also using these pinpoint accuracy missiles. Often not pinpoint enough though, unfortunately. And so the bird hero was desperately wounded, but fought on undauntedly, giving his whole life for this cause. And while Sita watched all of this, the unequal combat between the beating heart, with, and she had a beating heart and tearful eyes she watches on, and the sight of her makes Jatayu all the fiercer in his attacks on Ravana. But his years were telling on him, and he felt he must gather all his strength from one supreme attempt to conquer. And so regardless of his own personal wounds, he attacks Ravana fiercely with his wings broke off, and threw down his jewel crown and deprived him of his bow. And we have to pause here to question, in the cause of what is right, are we prepared to go to such lengths? Are we ourselves prepared to sacrifice our life against all the odds and stand up for what is true and what is right? This is a question for all of us. So you can understand Jatayo's condition, his wounds, and even his wings broke off and uh, threw down his jeweled crown and deprived him of his bow. This is what Ravana had done. And he attacked the chariot and killed the demon-faced mules and the charioteer and smashed the vehicle into a thousand pieces. And Ravana also fell on the ground, still clutching Sita. And the elements rejoiced to see Ravana fall. And the gallant old bird swoops down on Ravana's back and tears great chunks of flesh off it and tries to wrench off his arms, which held Sita. But Ravana had 20 arms. And no sooner was one pulled off than another took its place. And Sita was held in writhing helplessness. It's often a question that people ask about 
the great iconography, for example, with Hinduism, why so many arms and heads, and why do other creatures have many arms and heads? And you get worthy and good governments or good governors or good countries who are honestly desirous of the welfare of their communities. And how many arms do they have? Well, there's the military arm, there's the home affairs arm, there's the finance arm, there's the air force wing, there's the social security uh, uh, arms and hands and so on and so forth, you see. And even in oppressive governments, you'll find the same kind of arrangement. Anyway, at last, Ravana lets go Sita and unsheathing his sword, he cuts off the bird's wings and he cuts off the, the bird's talons. And the old bird was now, of course, completely helpless and just falls on the ground, unable even to move. And Janaki, that is Sita, runs and embraces Jatayu and cries, Oh, my father, you have given away your life for my sake. You are a second father to my Lord, and now you are no more. Oh, our devoted, brave friend, she laments. And Ravana turns toward her to take her up again. And helplessly, she runs, she runs here and she runs there, crying desperately. And she clings to the trees and cries, Oh, my Rama, where are you? Oh, Lakshmana, where are you? Won't you come to my rescue? Where is my beloved? And the Rakshasa at last catches her and he rises back up into the air. And as the dark and massive Ravana flies in the sky with her, Sita, struggling in his grasp, looks like a flash of lightning across a great black cloud. How beautifully Valmiki, the poet, captures these events. And the demon, the Rakshasa Ravana, carries her, uh, uh, carrying her, he looks like a mountain covered by a forest fire and the body of Ravana lit up by Sita coursed through the sky like a calamitous comet. And so we understand how Sita was carried away by this person of demonic nature, obsessed by lust, obsessed by greed, obsessed by power and completely overwhelmed by anger and revenge. And so as he carries her away, the sun grows dim and untimely darkness descends on the earth because as we know, in calamitous days where there is destruction and warfare, things become dark and hopeless. Even today in modern warfare, where country attacks country and sends missiles to various cities. What is the end result except a ruination? And so all the beings lament that dharma is destroyed. And the other day somebody asked me, please tell, can you tell me what is dharma? What is the definition of it? It is that principle that holds everything together in perfect alignment and harmony. The sun grows dim and untimely, and all these inauspicious signs are there. And somebody who is attuned to the signs will surely have an awakening call, but the ignorance is such that all of this is bypassed. Dharma, the thing that brings harmony, is destroyed. Righteousness, morality, all destroyed. Righteousness has disappeared, and virtue and pity are no more. Now we understand, of course, how Rama was born, how Vishnu incarnates in a scene that starts off as a parallel story at the beginning of the this story of Rama, and how all the deities are appealing because of this Ravana, and how Rama is born, or more accurately, Vishnu is born, as a cosmic balancing power to intervene in this calamitous affair. But the real, real crime here is this abduction. And so it's just inexcusable 
And then with this disappearance of Sita, with this abduction, virtue and pity are no more in the whole world. And the dumb creatures of the earth looking upwards, unable to speak human language, they shed tears. And Ravana, cruelly clutching the princess, she flew as towards his room. And as she was carried away, the petals fell down from the flowers she was wearing at that time, gathered from the forest, and they were strewn along the path below. Any kind of clue or paper trail, as it were, that shows where she is gone. They seem to announce the scattering of Ravana's fortune and her affluence. And Sita opens her eyes, red with anger and grief, and facing Ravana cries in a hopeless way, trying to reason. But you see, all reasoning is gone. Base fellow, see you boasted of your fame and your great origin and your warlike qualities to me, but you haven't behaved like a brave warrior. You've behaved like a thief. Aren't you ashamed of yourself? What sort of warrior is he who waits for the husband's absence to steal his wife and carry off a lonely, helpless woman when no one is nearer to prevent her? What deed of valor, what heroic deed is it to kill the old bird that tried to save me? How brave was your talk in the ashram? The world will no doubt remember and praise this great hero who dares not fight, but is prepared to steal. She is being sarcastic. And if indeed you come of a noble family, what a shame you brought upon it. And what do you hope by thus, by carrying me off? How long do you hope to live? Because as soon as Rama's arrow will seek you out and end your life, and he will surely do it. Know that the moment Rama sets eyes on you, you're dead. Don't hope to escape, your death is certain at his hands. What then do you gain by this cheating? I'll never be yours. In fact, I shall die before I yield to you, and you can't escape, my Lord, Rama, my beloved. And having incurred his wrath, there's no hope for you. Very soon you'll see the river Vaitarani in hell. The red hot image is waiting you there for your embrace. So is the tree with iron spikes, all the tortures of a hell. And Rama, within the hour, slew your army of myriad rakshasas. Remember in the Janasthana, that area. And Will he let you escape, do you think? Soon we will send you to Yama. Now the only way to reason with unreasonable people is by asking questions and getting people to think it out. That is bringing in rationale into the emotional situation. But this doesn't work. And it doesn't work with people who have an obsession and so while Sita is speaking these words of contempt and warning, Ravana, chariotless, he speeds like an arrow across the sky towards Lanka. And they went over many mountains and rivers. And Sita saw some people below standing on a hilltop. And she takes off her sash and, try, and tying up her jewels in it, throws the bundle down. And some may say that these people were hill tribes, hill tribes people. And she did this hoping that the ornaments that she was dropping might be seen by Rama and might give him a clue about the direction because Rama, when he returns, will have no idea. He'll see the trick. He already knows it. And he's rushing back to the ashram where he left Sita. And crossing the Pampa and the sea, Ravana enters finally the city of Lanka, his own capital city. And he goes to his apartments with the grief-stricken Sita, dragging her along. The fool thought he had secured the prize, but he was taking home his own death in a woman's form. And I pause here 
because you see, the other day was Women's Day, International Women's Day, and there are still many countries throughout the entire world that treat women as second-class citizens, that treat them as hewers of wood and drawers of water. In certain countries, for example, within Africa, this uh, lack of respect and understanding of the Divine Mother that appears as a woman is rife. And Swami Vivekananda was adamant, any country that does not honor women in this way, and he was talking you know, with specific regard to India itself, will certainly not prosper and will have many, many difficulties and problems because it is to insult the Mother Nature herself, the great divine universal Devi. So the fool that he was thought that he had secured a prize. Then summoning some demon-like rakshasis, he ordered them to keep watch over Sita because if you want to run a government and you are running it in an oppressive way, in a way that is an extension of your own personality, then all your governing uh, officers will be of the same. And we see this in many corrupt governments. We see that the whole government moves on that side. I just divert a little bit because in my own country, there was a military coup a few years ago, two, three years ago. And uh, all the government officials that previously had supported the, what was a, uh, some, a, a tyrannical personality or interpreted as such, they all came over to the new government. Most, not all of them, but many of them. And cha changed horses in a day. Anyway, so they watch over Sita and especially the commanding them as he did to let no one approach her without his permission. She's left by herself. But he does give them this command, please give her whatever she wants. Give her clothes or gold or jewels. He still feels he can bribe her because, don't forget, he doesn't want a rebel for a wife. And whatever she wants, you give. Serve her and do her honor as you would serve and honor me. And he adds this warning, anyone, anyone who utters a word which might offend her will be punished with death. No one knowingly or unknowingly should cause her anger or grief. He still feels that there's persuasive hope. And having therefore installed Sita in the inner apartment, not in jail or prison or anything like that, he considers what should be done. And he sends for some clever spies and gives them this mandate. So God wants to Janasthana where Kara lived. Watch carefully and bring me information or word about Ram, what Rama is doing. So long as that Rama is alive, I can't sleep. He is my greatest enemy. Now, previously he scorned him. But now, you see, behind the scenes, he really understands that Rama might well be uh, his opponent, his worthy enemy. And somehow he should be killed. So go boldly now and do your job in return. He doesn't want a confrontation. He wants a kind of assassination. And so imprisoned within a fortress in a sea-girt island, surrounded only by sea, difficult of access, Sita didn't know where she was exactly or how far from Rama she was. They're all very confusing. And so she expects that her Lord would somehow arrive and kill Ravana and redeem her. She may think, well, maybe Rama is nearby. How far did I go? I don't know. And though full of grief and thinking of the strengths and prowess of her Lord, she was herself bold and steady in her own mind. 
as we should all be in inauspicious circumstances. Whatever the circumstances in life, we still have the capacity to stabilize ourselves and to have strength and steadiness of mind, determination of mind. We are born and built like this. Now, it was all some, also some consolation for her that the Rakshasa's king didn't behave like a beast with her, only when he dragged her off, only when he threatened her. But now he has her, he now treats her in a royal fashion. And having dispatched his men to Janastana, Ravana returns to Sita's presence. Don't forget, Janastana is the area in which Rama and Lakshmana are. Anyway, going and approaching Sita, this time with a kind of kindness and generosity, or feigned kindness and generosity, he sees her, but he sees she's overwhelmed by grief and shedding tears. And all the Rakshasis, the demons, were watching her with care, and then he thinks that if she saw his wealth and power, I think she will yield to him. This is how he thinks. And she was therefore taken around on a tour of the great, great palace and shown the wealth and grandeur there displayed. No king on earth had ever possessed such wealth and means of enjoyment. And Sita was shown gold and jewels and silks in plentiful supply, but cautiously wrought plaf platforms, um, vehicles and towers. Curiously, she saw all these things, maidservants, every symbol of wealth and royal power, but her thoughts, of course, were elsewhere. You can have these prosperous kingdoms, but without the character necessary for the moral development of society. Ravana tries to convince her also of the vastness of his army. So here's, here's the wealth that you can enjoy. Here's the great sophistication of our civilization. And actually, here's my military might as well. But then she had already formed her opinion of his prowess and had described it to him in scathing terms. Yet Ravana argues, all this you can count and enjoy as your own. You shall be my queen, dearer to me than life itself. He's quite a romantic, but it's all false. It's all, behind it is all lust. He says, you see, I have many wives, but you should be mistress of them all, because the trouble is that in the oriental system where there are maybe multiple queens, or even a, a harem of attendants, there will be jealousy amongst the wives. And so who will be the head wife is an important thing. We see this in the courts of the Ottoman Empire, for example, and the intrigues within the uh, female quarters. So you'll be in charge of all of these. You'll be the chief wife. And hereafter, my love shall be for you and you alone. And listen to me. Do what I want, fulfill my desire. For hundreds of miles the sea surrounds this island, which is guarded by thousands of mighty soldiers. It's an ideally situated kingdom. Because in, even in a castle, you may have the castle surrounded by a moat. And, uh, but now there's this vast moat, not just around the, around the island, which is the sea itself. And so he reminds her, you can't escape. No one can enter the city, he boasts. No one among the gods or asherahs can match me in might, and they know it. What pleasure or honor is it for you to stick to a poor human creature banished from his kingdom, a destitute wandering in the forest? Why do you want to be in love with this man who's just like a beggar wandering in the forest. He doesn't have all this wealth. And he's just a human. He knows that he has a boon that he can defeat any celestial being. 
But humans, it doesn't cover it. Because a human, what is a human compared to the might of universal beings? To match your beauty, he says, you need my wealth. This is his persuasive argument. Don't waste the years of your youth. You're never again going to set eyes on Rama. So you can forget that. Be certain of that. Rama can't approach the city. He doesn't know where you are to start with. And even if he did, how will he cross the sea and face the army single-handedly? How will this happen? And treat this whole kingdom as your own, please. Treat me and all the obedient gods as slaves. Till now, because of your sins in the, some previous birth, uh, you have suffered hardship. Now he's bringing theology out. He's saying all this life in the forest and your hardships there is because of sins that you made in the previous life. He doesn't understand the law of karma associated with dharma. Hereafter, he says, you'll enjoy with me the fruits of your former merits. You now, these are your rewards. This is a kind of heaven on earth. And you'll be the queen of Lanka and the wife of the lord of Lanka and the conqueror of Kubera era, the great uh, deity of love. Let us take our pleasure floating above the world in the Pushpaka of Vimana. Aerial, you can have aerial visits. You can go by drone, if you will, in modern speak. Let the cloud of sorrow disappear from your face. Let the moon of joy appear. And as Ravana went on speaking thus, well, tears flowed from Sita's eyes, because none of this was persuasive to her pure heart. And she covers her face with the end of her sari. And as she didn't want her enemies to think that she was afraid, she covers her face. Now Ravana begs and importunes her, so her persuas his persuasive arguments doesn't work. Now he becomes pathetic. Don't be shy, there's nothing wrong in accepting me, nothing to be ashamed of. It's laid down that one should accept the gifts of God. Oh, beautiful one, I bow my head at your feet and beg you for your grace. He is now begging. I'm your slave, he says, forgetting my greatness and power. I thus beg you for your favor. Never in my life have I bowed in this way before anyone. And he really thought he could persuade her and gain her affection through these various means. You see our, how our mind also vacillates. How we, when we cannot get what we want, we become weak-minded. We become a victim. We come into victim mode, a poor me. We become pathetic, if you will. And so if one's mind is clear, one can courageously face any situation is the philosophical message, practical philosophical message. And in spite of her grief, therefore, Sita spoke boldly to the Rakshasa. She placed a little bit of grass between Ravana and herself before answering him. And boastful words were uttered by Ravana in sannyasi garb, sitting in front of the fruit served by her in Pachavati, Imprisoned, Sita now spoke as if in echo of those words. Know who I am. Dasarata was famed in all the three worlds, she says, and reigned long years and stood as a bulwark of dharma and defender of truth. His son, Rama, of godlike presence and lion-like valor, he is my husband. He and his brother Lakshmana, she says, will surely take your life. You know how Kara and his army were destroyed in Janasthana, Janasthana. As easily as an eagle carries a venomous serpent, he destroyed your huge army in Janasthana. He's not just a human. Because you have secured a boon that no god or asura can kill you, you've dared to make Rama your enemy because he's human. You think that your boon will save you, but I tell you, you can't escape. You'll surely meet your death at his hands. You are like the goat tied to the altar post for sacrifice, doomed to death. And the moment Rama sets his angry eyes on you, you'll meet your fate. My Lord will dry up the sea 
or bring down the moon if necessary to kill you and redeem me. It's certain. See, your evil deed will bring destruction on yourself and your kingdom. And my noble Lord lived unafraid in the midst of the Rakshasas in the forest. And like a hero, he fought and killed the Rakshasas who encountered him. And like a thief, like a thief, you have stolen me in his absence. You have used a cowardly method, but you can't escape. Your fate impels you to the sin because the honor of your ruin and the destruction of your race are near. So you ask me to accept you. How foolish. Can the crow approach the swan? Can a heinous sinner be allowed near the sacrificial fire? I don't value life or body. Do you imagine I would wish to live despised in the world by the world? Don't, don't dream that out of fear or for saving my life I shall yield to you. So having spoken these words, she kept quiet. And of course, this was like a red rag to a bull. Is that so? Ravana says. Very well. I shall give you 12 months time. If you agree to accept me, well and good. And if at the end of that period you refuse, my cooks will make meat of your body for my breakfast. This was the offer that he puts on the table. And after warning Sita in this way, he gives orders to the attendant Rakshasis. You should break her pride and obstinacy by some means or other or anything. Put her alone in the Ashoka garden and skillfully use fear and temptation to bring her to her senses. And as we tame a wild she-elephant, you should train her to submission. And angrily, he went to his palace. The Rakshasas, they take Sita to the Ashoka garden. It was a beautiful park. It wasn't like a prison. And it was attached to the women's apartments. And the trees were full of flowers and fruits and beautiful birds played among them. But here, surrounded and guarded by the really ugly and wicked Rakshasis, Sita was kept prisoner. And though it wasn't within the gray walls that we typically think of as a prison, it was, in fact, like a prison with no escape at all. And though overwhelmed by her sorrow, she has the faith that Ram and Lakshmi would somehow discover where she was and rescue her, and that her Lord would destroy Ravana and take her back to a happy life with him. And the lesson for us in life is this. In the most dire and difficult of circumstances, we should never lose our faith. We should never lose the faith that the Lord who brings obstacles and so-called problems before us also brings solutions and enlightenment and growth. The most difficult thing for us to handle, of course, is death. But death is simply uh, a means for our growth because our goal is to overcome mortality and realize our immortal nature. And so she was quite happy, or sorry, I would say confident, because she had this faith, even in the midst of her greatest sorrow, her isolation, her loneliness, and her heart is attached to Rama because she must be wondering, Rama doesn't know what has happened. Even though I have faith that he will come and rescue me. He is my hero. He is my lover. He is my beloved. He is my husband. He will come and rescue me. And Lakshmana is dedicated to me. He will come. He is protecting me. I have faith in this. This is on the one side. But on the other side, the deep sorrow of absence, the deep sorrow of disconnection, seemingly. 
Now, philosophically, we can put it this way. Supposing Sita represents the Jiva, seemingly in isolation and detached from our real nature. If Rama represents our real nature, rescuing our Jiva, reuniting yoga, reuniting ourselves with our true nature. This is indeed the most profound philosophical message behind all this of this drama. Anyway, sustained by this strong faith, she wasn't really frightened by the threats and she wasn't deceived by the temptations either. Not for one day or two, but for months, Sita suffered in this way, a close prisoner in the Ashoka garden. But her faith remained strong. The day was yet far off when the mighty Hanuman crossing the sea would visit Sita. And he would visit her in her sorrow and bring her the message of hope and love and the assurance of relief. There's no doubt this is how the story will unfold. Rama loves you infinitely, he would say. He'll be here soon. Don't be afraid. And all the women in our land who suffer sorrow in any way are so many replicates, replicas wherever we are of Sita. And so we can finish off with something like a prayer. May all the men be like Hanuman, pure and heroic helpers of such suffering women. And so from next week, we shall go to the Rama and Lakshmana and see how they are faring. Of course, we can understand when Maricha was struck by Rama's arrow and was about to die, and he resumes his own Rakshasa shape and cries aloud in a voice that it was exactly a simulation of Rama's, saying, O oh, Lakshmana, O oh, Sita. After this, of course, Rama immediately realizes how the Raksha, Rakshasa has deceived him and how he had been drawn away at such a long distance by the crafty Maricha. And he was full of anxiety as to what it could all mean. Alas, we have been badly deceived. It would be terrible if Lakshmana is also deceived by this cry and leaves Sita alone to come to my sucker, he's thinking. It looks as though the Rakshasas have planned this ruse to carry off Sita and eat her. That's his feeling. And you can imagine now his own anguish. When Sita hears what she will take as my cry of distress, she's sure to insist that Lakshmana should come and rescue, rescue me. And uh, in doing so, he will leave her and rush to my help. All of this he understands. And the howling of jackals and behavior of birds were all important to this disaster. And so there's trepidation in my heart, thinks Rama, or feels Rama. And it's important in itself of some danger close at hand. With this feeling of dread, he's thinking this to himself. And so he's now rushing back to the ashram and as he goes back on his way, he sees Lakshmana running towards him. Alas, the worst I feared has happened, exclaims Rama. And he holds Lakshmana's hands and cries in sorrow. Why, why did you leave Sita alone in the forest? You may be sure the Rakshasas have killed and eaten her. It wasn't right for you to leave her. I came and come away. It's now all over with Sita. I told you to stay and I told you to protect her. And fatigued and thirsty with a futile chase and now overwhelmed with anger and unbearable anxiety, Rama now breaks down. He cries again. If I don't see Sita in the ashram when we return, I shall surely die, Lakshmana. You'll return to Ayodhya, the survivor of us three, and tell them what has happened. And oh, how will Kausalya bear her grief? Lakshmana, you have more than fulfilled Kaikeyi's wishes. The Rakshasas will by now have visited Sita. And she's poor, she's unprotected, 
and all their pent-up hatred against all of us will be leveled at Sita. And surely they must have killed and eaten her by now. How could you leave her alone and come away? How could you be deceived by Maricha's false cry? What shall I do now? I shall see Sita no more. The Rakshasa's plan has succeeded. My trust in you was misplaced, and I shall never see Sita. How could you leave her and come away? And how could you, Lakshmana? Now you can have some deep, deep empathy for all of those abductees throughout the whole world. There are many who are abducted by what we might call the modern slave trade. There are children who are abducted. The whole family went on husband, uh, holiday. We have seen in the news episodes like this, or a child wandering off never to be seen again. And we understand the, the pangs of separation, which humanly speaking are being felt even by the noble Rama. And next week we'll pick up and see this episode, which is heart-wrenching, and Rama's desperation, and how Lakshmana manages to get him out of it by encouraging words of strength. So we leave this story off now, and we can contemplate the life lessons for us in this overall story of Rama. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, Thank you, Swamiji. Thank, Thank you, you, Swamiji. Thank you, Swamiji. Thank you, Swamiji. Thank you, Swamiji. Oh.